Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, looks like we're just about ready to get our session started. Uh, now, hopefully, the technology will hold out. Um, today, we're going to have a talk on best practices and resources for preventing infectious diseases in agritourism operations um, by Carrie Klum. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, just want to say thank you for coming to the last session on the last day of the conference. Appreciate it. Um, so just a tiny bit of background. Originally, two, um, two farmers were supposed to come with me to present, and they weren't able to travel here. So the beginning of the um, talk is going to be a video from them and then the end as well. Um, but Melody uh, Smith and Wendy Wustenberg, uh, they came to one of my workshops, uh, which is the material I'll be covering today a couple of years ago. Uh, at first, they were really freaked out, um, but then uh, they decided you know, to, to really use me as a consultant and they've become really great partners with me of how I can take the best practices um, that, I, that I know and how do you actually apply that on the farm. Um, a little bit more background about me quickly is that I am an infectious disease epidemiologist at the Minnesota Department of Health. So I'm coming at this from a very specific angle uh, that is probably the only straight public health person at this conference, maybe not, not quite. <laughs> um, um, but the reason why I actually got into any of this work is uh, part of my routine work at the health department is surveillance of diseases. So diseases that, um, if someone gets them in our state legally, their doctor has to tell us about it at the health department. And uh, I also do outbreak investigations. So I was noticing that every year we would have outbreaks associated with county fairs, state fair, uh, different agritourism operations. At that time, we were just thinking of them as petting zoos um, and trying to figure out how could we work upstream to prevent that from happening in the first place and realizing that we don't have a professional agritourism association in Minnesota and there isn't really a good way for us to know who's out there doing agritourism or for them to know about my information and best practices. Um, so that's where this came from and why we started doing this work. Um, and so I'm gonna see if this video will play with me clicking this. Yeah, it should just play. I think it's minimized. I'm so excited to share our agritourism safety toolkit with the international workshop. It is an incredible privilege. I am too. Oh my gosh. And look, Carrie Clums here. Come on in. It's so good to see you. Hey. Two years of Zoom calls. I know. Hi, oh my God. Hi, It's so good to be back on the farm. Yeah. Welcome, Carrie. Who's this little guy? This is Jinxie. And how old is he? Uh, he's about two and a half weeks old. I bet the International Agritourism Workshop attendees are wondering why there's a yak calf in Minnesota. Yes, a lot of people are surprised to see a yak calf in Minnesota as well. They see yaks for the first time here. They line up so much that we remember the infamous brochure we made in 2018. I brought a copy of it. I do. Remember we had the toddler, the cute kid kissing the yak calf? Yes. Uh, yeah, after we took your class on agritourism fun on the farm, we started to call this the how to give your toddler cryptosporidium. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yep, we learned a lot. We sure did. Well, I'm so happy that you guys can help me uh, tell all of the International Agritourism Workshop attendees our best practices for safe agritourism on the farm. We yeah. wish we could be there in person, but you go and do what you did for us, for everyone in the world. But first, let's have you wash your hands. Oh, it's a great idea. Here we go. The education we received in 2019 literally transformed the very mission of our nonprofit farmer-led 
agritourism organization. We learn to put safety first for our visitors, for ourselves, and even for our animals. On behalf of North Star Farm Tour, it's my great privilege to now introduce to the world, Carrie Klum, Senior Epidemiologist of the Minnesota Department of Health. Carrie, go do for the world what you did for us. Have a Thanks. good time. Good to see you all again. Bye. 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 <laughs> um, Melody actually has, uh, he's now passed away, but Jericho the Yak has a Guinness Book of World Record for the largest horns. So it's pretty cool when you go out to the farm. Oh, how do we get to the next slide? <laughs> There we go. Okay, so you've seen this about 100 times now by the third day of the conference. What is agritourism? It's, you know, no uh, agreed upon definition. So at the health department, we have a really broad definition that we use when we think about this. And this is really just any overlap of tourism and agriculture. Doesn't matter if money's exchanged. Um, if you're bringing your animals to people, we still think of that as agritourism, not just them coming out to your farm. It's pretty common in Minnesota for farms to take animals to daycares um, and to school settings. Um, so we also think of that as a form of agritourism. Um, <clears throat> I just found this fascinating. So if you look at the egg census data and the most recent egg census data aren't available yet. So the information we have between 2002 and 2017 showed a 370% increase in income on farms through agritourism. So um, it's not just our imagination that like more and more people are doing agritourism and I think we'll continue to um, for all the reasons that have already been covered at the conference uh, this week. So um, what we think about with agritourism is some additional responsibilities. So obviously you wanna provide your visitors with a great experience. And part of that is reducing the risk of people getting sick from your food or water while they're there, keeping them safe from injury, reducing the risk of people getting sick from your animals. And then you have to think about protecting your assets. And you know, I am not a lawyer or insurance agent, but um, thinking about liability insurance, which again has been covered a variety of times at this conference. So I'm just going to do a really short amount of food safety and general illness prevention. Um, in the past, when we've done these workshops in person within Minnesota, they've been half day workshops. Um, obviously I only have one hour, so I can't cover everything, but usually what we do is we have our um, Department of Agriculture and our Department of Health, Environmental Health Sanitarian, so the people who are inspecting or licensing um, there, and then my, my unit, the Zoonotic Diseases Unit from the Health Department. And so they go pretty far in depth of food safety, how you would prepare food, um, and what licensing would be required in Minnesota. And the Department of Agriculture does the same thing in terms of licensing and grants that they have available for on-farm improvements. Um, and then we cover um, what I'm going to cover with you today, but in more depth. Um, and I think in Minnesota in particular, the licensing is very confusing, although maybe it's like this in every state. But if you were selling fountain soda, the, um, the health department would license you, but if you were selling bottled soda, then the Department of Agriculture would license you. And so it's really hard for operations to navigate that. Um, so that's why we like to have um, all of the sort of health egg people there in one spot to answer questions for folks. So just a brief thing on foodborne illness and risk factors. Uh, we're really thinking about bacterial illnesses for the most part. So salmonella, E. coli, and campylobacter. And then the big one for us in terms of viral illness that we see a lot of foodborne transmission is norovirus or what people call the stomach flu. So there's no stomach flu, it's norovirus. Um, and this comes from poor personal hygiene. So, you know, people working while they're sick or still recovering, um, poor hand washing or not using gloves. Uh, contaminating food or equipment, not cooking the food to the correct temperatures or not keeping them either hot enough or cold enough to prevent bacterial growth. Oh, I went the wrong way. There we go. Um, so this is just basic for life, not just if you have a business, but don't prepare food for others if you have vomiting or diarrhea and don't prepare food for others for at least 24 hours after you've stopped having those symptoms. 
obviously washing your hands before you prepare food, and then don't handle ready to eat foods with your bare hands. So uh, when we think, talk about ready to eat foods, it's foods that don't have a kill step, right? Like you're not gonna heat them up where you could kill any bacteria that got on it. So salads, fruit, deli meats, things like that. Um, and then I already sort of covered this, that it's just gonna be so different in each state that I can't really speak to, speak to that at an international conference. And then uh, we talk a little bit about safety on the farm. If you went to Marsha Salzweedal's talk um, earlier in the conference, she's really the safety expert. Um, and so we just briefly mentioned some of these uh, inherent risks that are on the farm that are more um, you know, injury related. So working farm safety issues, just thinking through you know, not allowing your visitors to explore the farm unattended, don't operate farm machinery near them, uh, putting your buckets down and taking your keys out if people are coming out and storing unsafe equipment in the locked area if you can. And uh, farm machinery, just thinking about how the stuff you use every day and you know how to use it safely, um, visitors will have no idea. So tractors, combines, you know, front loaders, wagons, uh, people can fall from them, they can get pinch or crush injuries. Um, the worst case, you know, an entanglement and a power takeoff. And then thinking about your environment. So do you have electrical, electric fences? Um, are you able to turn those off while people are there? Or are you able to keep them away from the fences? Do you have a manure pit? Is, is that uh, in a secure area? Grain bins and silos, we all know are, are very dangerous. Um, and then hay mows. And considering they're very fun, but also opportunity for someone to get sick, um, injured. Um, so I'm not going to go into more detail about that because that's really Marsha's uh, area of expertise, uh, but she does have a great website that she mentioned, obviously, in her talk. And so we like to refer people to that website. There's a lot of good resources there. Okay, now this is the part that I'm actually... <laughs> um, this is my area of expertise now. So uh, we always think about this as a teeter-totter, the benefits and the risks, and how do we balance those out? Um, you know, I always, always feel like maybe I don't need this slide when I talk to this audience, right? Like, you know this. This is why you do what you do. Um, that, you know, people have lost that connection to the land, uh, understanding where their food comes from, understanding how animals behave, and then also having that human-animal bond that uh, I think we all feel when we're with animals. Um, but then, uh, because it's my job to always assess risk and think about like the worst thing that could happen, um, these are the things that I think about of animals can be unpredictable and kids can also be very unpre unpredictable. And so um, kids are more likely to get hurt because of their size and their behavior. You know, this is an example of where this kid might be totally fine, but also he doesn't have a way out. Like he could get pinned against here. Uh, or knocked over, not because the goats are intending to, but you know it's crowded and uh, they might get excited. Um, and then obviously we think about those zoonotic disease risks. So the zoonotic disease are diseases that we can share with animals. We can make animals sick, animals can make us sick. Um, and the really common ones that we think of are uh, influenza, like we currently have highly pathogenic avian influenza right now. We haven't had it confirmed human case, um, but there's always that potential that, uh, you know, the birds could make us sick from that. We can also give influenza to pigs. So um, I think, you know, sort of the baseline here is like, how do people get sick from animals? And the fact is that healthy animals carry germs. Those germs are normal for the animal and those, and don't cause them illness. Um, so it's just a normal part of their gut flora. It has nothing to do with how well they're cared for or the environment that they're in. They're going to have those germs. And you can't tell which animals have them just by looking at them. Oh, let's stop there. So germs are present in animal species. Those feces help spread germs into the animal's environment and onto their fur and their skin. And then people touch the animals or the environment and accidentally get the germs into their mouth. So we're talking about a fecal oral transmission route um, for, for all of these germs that I'm gonna focus on today. And so this is a picture from one of the fairs of, you know, reptiles naturally have salmonella. It's just part of their natural flora. And so we have a little girl, you know, holding ice cream and, and petting, um, that lizard right there. And so that's a good way to get salmonella in her hands and then, you know, potentially into her mouth. 
So we think about two main transmission routes. Uh, this is through direct animal contact, very uh, self-explanatory, but you know, again, these are pictures from different fairs around Minnesota. And this is, we want people to interact with the animals. We want them to be able to touch the animals, but this is also something that um, you as an operator need to think about, but also the people coming up to visit your, your farm, um, that if they're gonna interact with the animals and touch them, they have to realize that there could be germs um, that they're getting from those animals and to wash their hands. Um, the one that maybe we don't think about as much is this indirect animal contact. And so it's when you're touching a surface or just being in the environment with the animals um, that you can get those germs on your hands and then transfer them to your mouth. And I always just feel like this is such a classic picture right here of like, my son would totally do this. Just like stick his mouth on the railing. Well, here's, you know, an example of a railing with manure on it because this is a barn area and it's not going to be clean. Um, so I think a lot of times this, this transmission route doesn't get thought about quite as much. Um, and then we always talk about like, are, more, are certain people more likely to get sick than others? And the answer is yes, these are high risk groups. And um, these are our standard high risk groups in public health for most diseases. So children under the age of five because their immune systems are not fully developed yet adults over the age of 65 because your immune system begins to wane a little bit at that age, pregnant women, and then people with immu uh, compromised immune systems. But in particular, when we're talking about agriculture settings, we also have to think about urban and suburban people that are never around animals. They don't have the opportunity to be exposed to those germs. They're completely naive to them. And so they are at higher risk than someone who lives or works on a farm where you are in that environment every day, you're being exposed to those germs. If you grew up on a farm in particular, you probably got sick as a kid, maybe very mildly and just never even knew that you got an infection and have some immunity that way. So the ones that we worry about the most are E. coli 0157H7. Has everyone heard of that one, I think? Like you really think about ground beef with that, right? Um, salmonella, Campylobacter and Cryptosporidium. I don't feel like Campylobacter is as well known. Um, or cryptosporidium. So cryptosporidium is actually a parasite and it has a hard shell around it. And so that one is trickier to uh, kill, right? Because it's got a hard outer shell. Um, so all of these pathogens are essentially found in pretty much all farm animals. Um, with E. coli, we're really thinking about ruminants. They uh, will naturally have E. coli. And then the symptoms are pretty similar for all these pathogens as well. So most common is diarrhea, um, having fever or vomiting, stomach cramps. Um, with E. coli 157, you can also end up with bloody diarrhea. And so this one is the most concerning for us in terms of like how sick people can get from it. And um, now I'm gonna talk about even more about why you should be concerned. So this is an old picture now and this kiddo is recovered and fine. Um, but there's something called hemolytic uremic syndrome or HUS that can be caused by an E. coli 0157 and actually not just a 157. Um, other E. coli's can do this too, uh, but it's a severe illness where kids will end up hospitalized and 5% of those cases are fatal. Kids under the age of five are at highest risk for this illness. Um, and hospitalization, hospitalization costs, as you can see, is really high. Um, what, without getting too nerdy here, um, so there are different, <laughs> certain E. coli have a gene that makes a toxin. It's called a Shiga toxin, S-H-I-G-A. And that toxin is the baddie. So if you have an E. coli that makes an STX2 Shiga toxin gene, what that does, that toxin breaks apart your red blood cells and then your kidneys get clogged up with your red blood cells and your kidneys stop working. And that is what that HUS is referring to is this breaking a part of your red blood cells. You're gonna have bloody diarrhea. You're gonna start um, to have your kidneys not be able to function as well. Um, and there's no uh, treatment for E. coli 157. Like if we give people antibiotics, it can actually make it worse. So it's really supportive care and letting the body fight off that bacteria and let the toxin, you know, getting, flushing the toxin out of the body. Um, and I will say that when this happens, so this is sort of your worst case scenario as an operator. And like two weeks before I came here, this happened. So we had a county fair and we get reports when people are sick, they go to their doctor, they get tested. 
Um, but we also are able to uh, use, um, our lab is uh, able to isolate the bacteria from someone's stool that's sick. So, okay, we've, we grew the E. coli bacteria. And then they're able to do PCR, which is polymerase chain reaction. They can actually look at the entire DNA code of that bacteria and they can map it out. And so they're able to tell us that there are um, four people that all had the exact same identical E. coli bacteria in their, in their body. And so we know that like that exact same DNA from the same uh, E. coli for all four people. So we knew that something was going on. And so we interviewed them. Lo and behold, they all went to the same county fair. Um, two of them were under the age of two, developed HUS, were hospitalized. One of them ended up on dialysis, both needed blood transfusions, um, which is, the worst, right? Like this is not, I, I don't like doing these. No one likes these. The county fair certainly didn't want to hurt anyone or have anyone get sick. Um, and so right now I'm still in the middle of that investigation. We went out, we sampled, we took, um, you know, manure samples. We took sponge. They're like literally wet sponges that you swab along the environment. Um, and we're going to see if we can find that exact same E. coli bacteria that was in those people on the farm. Um, and that's just what we, our standard procedure in public health, we have an obligation to investigate outbreaks, figure out what caused them, and then try to put interventions in place in the future. So we're working with that fair. We've already met with their board once. We're going to continue to work with them on what could be addressed for next year, um, and mitigate those risks. But, um, I have, I have to deal with this unpleasant part too, is that when we do outbreaks, um, depending on whether or not we can identify everyone that could have been exposed or how long ago that event was, we sometimes have to do press releases. And when that happens, um, the media really picks up on it. And so you certainly don't want your name out in the press because you're associated with making people sick. Um, oftentimes lawsuits result from these too, especially if you have someone who's hospitalized and you have a very large medical bill. Um, I actually have a lawyer request sitting in my email right now, even though my investigation is not done. Um, and so this is another reason why I care so much about this topic and I want to talk to farmers um, because I don't want this to happen to anyone. No one wants to lose their farm or their business. Um, and this is uh, an old outbreak now from 2014 that I investigated, but usually they don't go to a jury. Usually they're settled out of court and we never know for how much, but this one did. And they found the farm uh, at fault and awarded the family seven and a half million dollars. So um, this is why we take it so seriously and why we care about this so much. I'm not trying to freak you out, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I lay all of that groundwork for why I want to talk about these best practices. And so these best practices, this is in, uh, this is one of the handouts that I attached uh, to this session, but it's, um, it's a national set of best practices that are created by a group of experts. Um, so it's public health and veterinary experts from all over the United States um, that form a committee and they update it regularly. And um, because there is no federal regulation around this, and you know, some states will have some limited liability laws, some have nothing. Um, what we have seen on our side at the health department is that when there are lawsuits brought against um, an operation due to an outbreak, uh, their lawyers are using this set of best practices um, to say, all right, well, were you following them? If not, this is why we think you are to at fault here. Um, another thing that I attached and is available on our website is this best practices checklist. So this document that I <laughs> referred to is like 36 pages long and it's peer reviewed and it's pretty dry to read. Like I had a, you know, I had to take breaks reading it. Um, so what we did is we distilled the essence of it into this one page two-sided checklist that you can walk through your facility and see like how many of these best practices are we currently doing? Where are, what are things we're missing that we really should do? Um, it's a fillable PDF or you can print it off. And then, you know, there's a place to sign and date it if you wanna keep track of your progress. Um, 
Okay, so the main problem, as we see it from the health department uh, view, is most visitors don't understand that healthy animals can carry germs that may make them sick, and that and lack of understanding the inherent risk prevents them from taking action to reduce the risk. So the goal is to minimize those risks using best practices, recognizing we can never get the risk to zero. Um, so the first thing that we think about is engineering out risk. So your animal exhibit facility design. Um, one of the things that I think sometimes gets overlooked is your order of operations. So if you're having people at your farm, you're going to do animals and food, like think about how, what order you do those things in, how they will move through your space. I know that people like to do, for example, here's the cow, here's the milk, now it becomes the cheese, now you eat the cheese. And like logically that makes a lot of sense. But from a risk perspective, it's the opposite of what would reduce your risk, right? So having people eat the cheese first before they're in that animal environment, before they're touching things, um, certainly uh, is less risky um, because we're not always able to ensure people are washing their hands well enough to, to take all the germs off their hands. So that's one thing to consider. Um, every venue should have three areas. So non-animal areas, transition areas, both at the entrance and the exit, and then the animal area where, you know, obviously that's where people are interacting. Um, so the non-animal area, no animals are displayed. Um, so if people are going to eat, uh, you'd want them doing it in that area. Make sure they have a, a spot to wash hands and that there are signs. The transition area, um, I think it's maybe, is it here? Sorry. Nope, it's not. Okay, so ideally, if you can in your building, you'd have a one-way flow of traffic. You'd have one entrance and a separate exit and everyone would just move through in a line. A lot of times you just can't do that with the facility that you have. And so then you can sort of make your own entrance and exit transitions by how you move people through that space. So um, um, let's see. So the entrance transition, we really wanna focus on education. So you can put signs up. Um, Signs are great, but also like after a while, people stop seeing signs, right? If you have too many signs, just don't read them. So if you are able to have staff or volunteers that are there being, you know, an introduction, a welcome to our space, you know, as you move through the space, enjoy the animals, at all, but also please remember to wash your hands when you're done, put your food and drink away while you're in here, those verbal reminders. Um, and then if you want a place for people to store their items, um, we feel really conflicted about this. The compendium says that like strollers and wagons shouldn't be in there. Um, I, uh, at MDH, we're sort of like, well, but if they're little and they're in the stroller, then they're not like falling down into the environment. Uh, you can get contamination on the wheels of a stroller, but uh, you can also wash those off pretty easily, right? Versus having a, ch a child like fall down into the hay or whatever you've got down for bedding. It has uh, decided to not work. Okay, so some key messages for the entrance uh, transition signs is, you know, animals can carry germs that might make people sick. Keep your hands out of your mouth, don't eat or drink, uh, put bottles or sippy cups, uh, pacifiers away, um, and then telling them about those high risk groups. Um, this is an example of Minnesota State Fair took our messaging and branded it. Um, so you can certainly do that, like use our messaging and then brand it with your farm's brand. So it doesn't have to be intimidating and it can be on brand with everything else you're doing. And then the exit, we want to make sure there's hand washing facilities that people like walk into as they're leaving so they can't miss them. How to wash your hands properly. And again, if you have people there reminding staff, they're reminding people to wash hands, that's ideal. Um, then the animal area. So really contact with animals through a fence. Um, best practice is not to allow visitors into the pen for you know, both injury and disease risk. Um, keeping food and beverages out of those areas. And then thinking about your waste management, um, how you're gonna get that out of your animal area, which we'll cover in a little bit. Um, okay, examples of good animal visitor interaction. So petting through or over barriers. These are all, um, you know, people are still able to engage with the animals, but there is a, a barrier between them. Um, these are ones that would not be a best practice. So they're inside the pen. Um, you know, the risk of injury increases, uh, risk of, you know, contaminating their clothing or shoes increases as well. 
Um, here are lots of examples of, you know, food or drink uh, in the animal area. Um, also reminding people things they might not think about like chewing tobacco or smoking. That's a hand to mouth activity that they're doing. Um, so we have actually, there's been reports of example, like just having a turkey leg, for example, at the fair and you walk through the barn and just the dust that gets kicked up and settles on your turkey leg and then you eat it, right? So that's what we're trying to avoid here. Um, we've also, me and my colleagues have seen, you know, like the Cheerios on the stroller tray and the goats like eating the Cheerios, like sharing with the kid. Um, that's a, a good way to, to um, end up having some germs that your kiddo can get into their mouth. Um, I think someone else showed something like this similar uh, earlier today, but thinking of uh, creative ways for people to feed animals, um, you know, to minimize the human animal contact. So this is a number of years ago, one of our um, exhibitors just created these PVC pipes. He cut them in half. Um, the kids loved it. They actually liked it more because you could shoot the, the feed down the tube and the animal could eat it. Um, one, you can end up with germs on your hands, right? With hand to mouth feeding, but uh, we also see bites or tears, which are not intentional from the animal, but um, children's skin is really thin. And so when they're trying to grab the food, they can al also bite, bite the child by accident. Okay, some animal care and management. Um, so we've got um, things to consider about your species. So carefully choosing the types of animals at your venue can reduce the possibility of disease and injury. So some species or ages of those animals are more likely to carry germs and so they're higher risk. So basically everyone's favorite animals are the highest risk. Um, so calves um, are definitely, they, every single dairy calf in the United States gets cryptosporidium. It's just like, it's on every dairy farm. It happens, they have scours um, and then they get better and they're fine, um, but they will have it. Um, chicks, we call salmonella bombs at the health department. And they cause uh, nationwide outbreaks every spring when people buy their poultry for the year. Um, and then goats uh, also, because they're ruminant, they're one of our E. coli risks uh, along with calves. Um, so bunnies are really low risk. We like, don't worry about bunnies at all in terms of diseases, horses as well. Uh, and then pigs can have salmonella and campylobacter, but we just don't see a lot of transmission from pigs to people. Um, so if you're going to have these, um, you know, higher risk animals, these young animals that are, um, you know, going to get scours or shed a lot when they're younger, um, you know, having them behind a barrier where people can't directly interact with them is the best practice. Um, so this is all common sense stuff that I'm sure you're already practicing that, you know, if you have any recent abortion, diarrhea, respiratory or skin disease that they would not be on display and they would be um, isolated from the other animals um, that you're, you're checking your animals every day. I, or I already know that for signs of illness or injury and then removing them promptly, um, you know, if you do notice them getting sick. Uh, because we know that when animals have diarrhea or scours, they're shedding more of the bacteria than they normally would. Um, and stress and overcrowding will also do that too. So making sure that your animals are um, not in a stressful environment and have enough space, uh, they will also shed less of these bacteria. Um, cleaning and disinfecting. So they're two separate processes. And you know, if, you're, if you know you're having people out to the farm, um, you want to think about what can you do to reduce the load of bacteria as much as possible. So uh, you would want to clean surfaces in the animal area that visitors touch like railings and barriers. And you want to do that daily if you're having people out, you know, every day, or if you're going to have one event, make sure you do it before the event occurs um, the day before and when manure or uh, debris is visible. So Cleaning is really just using water and soap um, and really just getting that visible debris off. So you have to clean first before you can disinfect. You have to remove the visible dirt that you can see. And then um, the disinfecting will actually kill the bacteria. So uh, there's really good products on the market now, accelerated hydrogen peroxide products. Uh, they're really safe. They're safe for the animals, they're safe for people, and they're really effective. Um, they're commercial products that you can buy. I'm not allowed to tell you brands because I work for the government. So you can Google and you'll see the different brands that are um, out there, or you can just use good old fashioned bleach in a one to 32 dilution, which is a half a cup of bleach to a gallon of water. 
Um, and then you need to apply it and let it dry. You don't want to wipe it off. So um, if you're in the biosecurity session earlier where they're talking about boot washing and the contact time, there's always contact time for disinfectants. And so usually it's like 10 minutes. So it's really important that you have that contact time and that you let, let it dry for it to work effectively. Um, waste management considerations. So removing feces and soil bedding promptly. Um, if you can sort away from the public, think about rainfall. Uh, I know this, this is a fair example again, but we had a county fair where they were stu uh, storing their manure at the top of a hill and then it rained and it all washed down the hill into where people were walking through the venue. So just thinking about you know, where on your property is uh, the best place to put that to avoid runoff. Um, just keeping your, your uh, tools um, out of the public, <clears throat> keeping away from the public so they can't access it. And then um, if you can, <clears throat> excuse me, if you can remove the bedding and the waste um, in a path where people don't go, that's ideal. Sometimes that's unavoidable where you just have to take it out through the walkway that people are using. Um, but if you're able to avoid that, that's uh, you know the preferred way. I get this question a lot: Can a veterinarian test a venue's animals for germs, and then you know we can be good to go if they're negative? And I wish it was that easy, but the short answer is no. And it's no because these germs are a normal part of the gut flora for these animals. So a positive test wouldn't surprise us. Um, germs are only shed in the feces from time to time. So you might test today and it's positive and we take a sample tomorrow and it's negative. So just because an, we get a negative test one day doesn't mean the animal's germ free. So it doesn't really help us from a risk management perspective. Um, the way we think about it is we just make an assumption that all animals could have germs that may make people sick. And then we need to, um, act accordingly with our hand washing, our education, and our engineering designs. So a little bit about staff education. Uh, we really, um, you know, the main messages we want staff to understand is that healthy animals can carry germs that may make people sick. Sometimes these illnesses can be really serious, and that the easiest thing that we can implement is to have um, hand washing for visitors and for them to use the hand washing. If you're the owner or operator, um, from the health department perspective, there's a few additional responsibilities. So really understanding and applying the recommendations we're covering right now from the best practices, training your staff on the risks and prevention at least once a year uh, to refresh them, and then making sure that you and your staff are comfortable explaining the risk and the prevention concepts to visitors so that you understand the concepts enough that you can tell your visitors what those concepts are. And then for visitor education, um, you know, the two best ways to educate people are through verbal education from staff and then well-placed and effective signs. Uh, this is not a real sign, but our graphic designer made it. Um, and I just think it's funny, but it's not one of the signs that we have. Um, but, you know, I think initially we had some concerns from operators of like, I don't wanna scare people. I don't wanna tell them all the, you know, here's all the things that could happen that are bad. And we don't want that either. Um, so if you can just sort of weave it into the conversation about the farm and the animals, and it doesn't have to be this scary thing. It's just part of the conversation of, you know, you can make my animals sick. My animals could make you sick. And so here are the things that we do to protect the animals and us. Okay, so uh, just a little bit about the hand washing. So some key points to improve hand hygiene. We did some studies now it's been a long time at the state fair and county fairs of like how many people actually wash their hands and it was awful. It was like, you know, 30%. Um, so some of the things that are helpful to increase that is having that verbal reminder from staff, um, large signs that make it really clear, especially if you have um, a really big event where it might be crowded, like a big sign that makes it clear where the hand washing stations are. Um, you know, again, having the staff at the exit area to remind people keeping them convenient, clean and close by. So like we say, like literally tripping over them when they leave that they like can't miss that hand washing facility and making sure that you have adequate water, soap and paper towels. Um, so, you know, we also looked a lot at the different designs that we are seeing at different facilities. 
And the one on the, the left is um, a good example of a station that's accessible to children and uh, um, adults and those that might be in a wheelchair, for example. Um, and they should be low enough so that everyone can access that. Another um, aspect uh, that's good on the left-hand side is that it's um, hands-free. So like they don't have to push a, a button with one hand while they're trying to wash the other hand. They can wash both hands at the same time. And then it's really intuitive how you would use this um, hand washing station on the left. Where the one on the right, there's not very good flow. The kid can't really reach the pump or you know he's really struggling to use that station. Um, here's another example of like a very complicated one. There's like a whole list of instructions and a hand pump. Um, and people just would look at it and then walk past it and say like, I'm, I'm just not even gonna bother. I don't know how to use this. Um, we also noticed that if uh, there were any lines, people would just like, they have the lowest barrier will prevent them from washing their hands. If there's too long of a line, they'll just skip it. Um, and then a note about hand sanitizer. So sanitizer does have a place. It can quickly eliminate some germs, but it's not effective against all germs. So earlier in the talk, I mentioned cryptosporidium, which is a parasite. It does not kill cryptosporidium, for example, because the alcohol can't break through the shell. Um, and it doesn't work against norovirus. So it also won't work if your hands are visibly dirty. It needs to contain at least 60% alcohol and we really think of it as a stopgap. So you would use it until you can get to soap and water, but it doesn't replace soap and water. Just checking my time here. Um, so this is really talking about you know, proper insurance coverage. This is coming back from the um, Integrating Safety and Agritourism website. I think they have some really good resources here. My experience as an epidemiologist, you know, when I talk to people after they've had an outbreak and the bad thing has already happened. Um, what I've noticed, at least in Minnesota, is a lot of people very slowly get into agritourism without realizing that they've started doing agritourism. It sort of happens over time and it creeps. And they never thought about insurance coverage or needing to adjust that or realizing that they had taken on this extra liability. Um, so I just think that's so important to have a conversation with your insurance agent, if you work with a lawyer, to make sure that you, you have the adequate coverage. Um, and they actually have an insurance discussion sheet, which is really nice. Okay, so I've got just a few resources and then there's a video from Melody and Wendy again to close it out. Um, so this is the Safer Faces uh, online training that we have. So this is basically taking everything I talked about very quickly today and breaking it down into six modules that are self-paced. It's free, um, but it goes every, over everything in detail of these best practices. You get a certificate mailed upon completion. I did not think to put a QR code in and I should have, um, but you can go to our um, health department website and find it. Um, and we're actually looking to revamp this and um, it's on an older platform and things have just uh, changed so much in the last two years. Um, so that's one of our projects that we'll be working on. And then the Upper Midwest Agricultural Safety and Health Center or UMASH Center, uh, the health department is part of that center. And so they have some videos that we've made and then they have a really good resource bank of our resources and other resources um, that you could, could look at. We have posters um, that are laminated and free um, if you, you know, don't want to make your own. Um, and then we also have some of these handouts, which I have in person. Um, but this is like meant to be, you know, if people are coming out to your farm, like a school group that you would send this home with the permission slip. So it's just little reminders for uh, families of, you know, what, how they should prepare their kids for coming out to your farm. Um, and then CDC also has stickers now, like washing your hands um, after visiting. So these would be resources that are all free and available um, if you're interested in them. And then um, there's also a toolkit from that association that created these best practices. So they've uh, asked for, you know, health departments all across the country to sort of send in um, their, their um, resources. And so you can go on that NASPHV website um, and look at that toolkit and use anything off of there as well. And then I think this is a video.
Hopefully. Melody, we did so many things wrong for so many years. We sure did. You know, we're friendly farmers. We welcome people to our farms. We give them hugs, give them run of the farm, feed them food. Let them feed, pet the animals while they eat their food. I was serving food that I realized I didn't have a hand, food handling license for. I didn't have the right liability insurance. Lots of our farmers did not have the proper business structure set up to protect their personal liabilities. They also didn't have first aid kits or the training for their staff, volunteers, and even the family to know who to call in an emergency. Yeah, hand washing stations, basic hand washing stations. You know, I, this book changed it for us. It's that Fun on the Farm Agritourism Workshop book that does exist out online, but two pages in here apply to every farm anywhere. It doesn't matter what state or nation you're in. If you walk around your unique farm operation and you ask these questions of yourself, you can absolutely improve how you do business. And that is important because agritourism is a business and we have to treat it like that for the sake of the public. Safety is a worldwide issue. It sure is. Yeah, we have so many folks to be thankful for. We reached out we reached out to the Minnesota Department of Health, Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and UMASH, the Upper Midwest Agricultural Safety and Health Center, and Mayo Clinic Health System. Those two, those organizations, public and corporate, stepped up to make this toolkit. Maybe we should go and show everybody. Yeah, let's go share our safety toolkit. Something we did right. Something we did right. <laughs> Our biggest takeaway from that education we got in 2019 was the critical importance of hand washing, especially on a farm. Unfortunately, none of our farms were set up with hand washing stations, were they? No. So tell us how this happened. Yeah, we couldn't find any to buy. So not only are we friendly farmers, we're also frugal farmers. So we found items on our farm to put this hand washing station together. Over the fence feeder for the drain receptacle a five gallon bucket to hold the dirty water, two by fours to make this sturdy stand, and a clean water receptacle through the crock to wash your hands and the dirty water out that you can put in, in a pasture or water your garden. We also built a very handy slide. Yeah, it has this nice weather proof bucket that we can put all your extra products in like your paper towels, soap, trash can receptacles, anything, anything you need. Anything you need, you can put right back in the handy stand. You can also afford to build as many of these as you need. On each side are educational posters from the state of Minnesota. These describe how to properly wash your hands for 20 seconds. Unfortunately, it was in English and we had been taught it's our job to keep everyone safe. In our case, we welcome everyone. Because agriculture is the language around the world, visitors come from all over the world. Many of them do not preferentially speak English as a link language or even as a second language. We took care of that with the help of our partners we mentioned earlier. With a smartphone, you can scan code and link yourself on our website to 19 translations of this poster, free. Here are two examples. This is in Chinese. This one is in Hmong. Both populations of people who love to come and visit us. On behalf of our member farmers, we want to thank Carrie Klum for inviting us to be with you today to share our resources with the world. This digital toolkit is free to you thanks to public and corporate funders and the donation of professional services by talented people who are all listed in the print materials. Download the do-it-yourself handstand blueprint, the step-by-step do-it-yourself video, and the hand-washing poster in 19 languages as our pay-forward gift from Minnesota to agritourism hosts and public health organizations worldwide. Thank you, Carrie. I think... Um... It is five till the hour right now. I know they want us all up there at the where the plenary sessions are for the closeout session because apparently things start right at four o'clock. So thank you again, Carrie. And if, and if there are some questions for Carrie, I'm gonna ask you to take them in the hallway or through the Whova app or whatever. Um, 
and um, or you can stay here for a few minutes and you can do that. So is there anyone online still? Okay, were there any questions out there that they, okay. If they, if you out there online have any questions, please um, send them through the Whova app. Thank you very much. <laughs>